Good afternoon, those of you in the East Coast and uh, in the afternoon part of the day. Uh, this is Robert Elliott. My, my great, very pleasant duty to um, and uh, pleasure to welcome you all to this second talk in PDF's seventh series of PD Expert Briefings on the subject of anxiety in Parkinson's disease. Uh, much talked about, uh, much concerned about, and often not enough um, presented at meetings like this. So we're delighted to be able to uh, present this very important talk and in the hands and voice of a, of a very senior a member of the profession, uh, Dr. Joseph Friedman, who I'll be introducing shortly. I'd like to recognize that um, <coughs> our collaborators at PDF in this particular series uh, are the members of the Association of Independent Parkinson's Research Organizations, a group of seven or eight, I think it is now, regional organizations in Parkinson's um, who band together with us to choose the topics and to present with us uh, to a national, international audience, <coughs> and, excuse me, the various topics that we do. So we welcome AIRPO involvement. We also welcome uh, the involvement of four corporate partners, AbV Incorporated, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, and Lundbeck LLC. We simply couldn't do this without the support. We appreciate it very much. Of course, it goes without saying that the content of the series is entirely our responsibility and not that of our sponsors, but we really value their involvement. <coughs> A couple of housekeeping things before we start. Um, as mo many of you here, I know, are on this call are regulars, so you know the routine. Uh, the PowerPoint slide deck can be downloaded from the reminder email that you all should have received this morning or from PDF's own webpage that highlights this talk on our website. So um, do uh, check in with that, uh, that if, you, uh, if you need to access this data. Uh, to qualifying health professional friends of ours who are doing this, in other words, for credit, they can earn one free um, continuing education credit through the American Society on Aging, which has uh, agreed to be a uh, sponsor with us at this particular session. And so please take advantage of that if you're registered as a health professional and if you've indicated that you would like to receive these CEUs. You should receive an email by the end of the day on step with steps as to how to collect it, and then 30 days until February 4 to actually do that and make sure you have your credit. So now to move to the introduction of our very distinguished speaker, Dr. Joseph Friedman is well known to many of you here, to many in the field. He told me a few minutes ago that he's been in his current very important role as director of the Movement Disorders Program of Butler Hospital and a professor uh, and uh, the chief of movement disorders at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University in Providence for some 30-something years. So he knows the place well. He knows the uh, uh, certainly uh, movement disorders backwards and forwards, and he's a major um, researcher and presenter in areas of, uh, of uh, the non-motor, as we call it, aspects of Parkinson's, or perhaps more properly, the behavioral components of, um, of Parkinson's. And he has uh, written extensively on subjects like depression, psychosis in Parkinson's, and of course today's topic, um, anxiety. I should mention among his many public publications, one uh, book that I know is uh, very much current and uh, very popular in the field for those interested in further reading. It's called Making the Connection Between Brain and Behavior, Coping with Parkinson's Disease, uh, a very broad and very in uh, important subject matter that covers today's topic, but also many others too. So take advantage of this if you're interested in further reading. Um, we're really thrilled to have um, um, Dr. Friedman with us. He's been a long time collaborator with Parkinson's Disease Foundation in a number of different areas, including advising uh, various groups that are involved in, uh, in studying the different aspects of the disease, including he's um, been a, a member of our um, uh, leadership of the, uh, the group, the, the uh, program that we call PDF Community Choice Research Awards, um, where he's been in one of his many roles as well I would describe as the public citizen that he is, as well as being a distinguished scientist and a clinician. So it's our great pleasure to introduce Dr. Friedman. He will speak as is customary in the series for around 30, 40 minutes, and we've then allowed at least 15, 20 minutes afterwards um, for questions. You can start those coming at any point. We have uh, Eli Pollard, our director, and also uh, Valerie Holt, 
uh, taking down notes from the computer as we speak, as he speaks. So start the questions coming in, and we'll take those we can have time for after his talk. Um, in the event that we may not finish all of them, don't be disturbed by that. We'll find ways to answer them later um, at a more convenient moment for you and for us uh, in the event that we run too far over our hour. So, Dr. Freeman, it's really a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much um, for joining us, and the you. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind uh, and generous uh introduction. Um, now, I, uh, okay, I'm just adjusting my slides. Um, the, the topic of anxiety is really a very, very important topic in Parkinson's disease um, because it's such an underappreciated problem in Parkinson's disease. Uh, I've been involved in Parkinson's disease uh, now for over 30 years, and when I started in the field, Parkinson's disease was considered quite appropriately a movement disorder, and the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's were almost not recognized. People knew that Parkinson patients were frequently depressed. Uh, the doctors knew that they also often had constipation, uh, and that was about the extent of it. And over the past uh, 15 to 20 years, but with increasing, uh, increasing uh, understanding, we've come to appreciate how important the non-motor aspects of Parkinson's disease are. And these include things uh, that are part of the body, like constipation, like uh, orthostatic hypotension, where people drop their blood pressure when they stand up, but also the behavioral aspects, the, uh, the fact that depression is common, that uh, fatigue is very common, that the medications we use for treating Parkinson's disease uh, quite frequently can produce hallucinations and other problems. And although there has been uh, an increasing understanding and focus by researchers and clinicians on behavioral aspects of Parkinson's disease, I've really been quite, uh, unfortunately, sort of surprised that anxiety has not figured in as important, I think, as it really is. Now, we all deal with anxiety. Uh, anxiety is often described as nervousness or worry. Uh, it's described in the DSM-5. DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's the definition, it's the collection of definitions of uh, all psychiatric disorders. And they describe anxiety as excessive concern with the anticipation of future threat. Now, anxiety is a normal part of human life. We all have something to worry about. When patients tell me that their lives are perfect, that there's nothing to worry about, I start to worry a lot because it means that they are not aware of something. You worry about the health of your relatives, you worry about paying the mortgage, you worry about whether your roof is going to link in the next snow. There's always something to worry about. But anxiety may become a problem when it interferes with the quality of life and interferes with normal function. One can worry quite a lot in an appropriate manner. You worry about a loved one who is sick and might die or might come to some kind of harm, and that would be appropriate. You might have a child serving in the armed forces, for example, and it would be, uh, it would be unusual and probably inappropriate not to be anxious about that person. But we all know people who worry about things for which there really is no good reason to worry. Um, and these are people who suffer from anxiety. We talk about nervous Nellies. So those are people who are overly anxious about everything. There's one particularly interesting aspect of anxiety that occurs in Parkinson's and not so much in other disorders, uh, which is an overlap between anxiety and something we call akathisia. Akathisia is a technical term meaning not to sit, but it describes a sense of restlessness 
that people have. It's very common with certain types of medication as a side effect, but it also occurs in people with Parkinson's disease, whether they're treated or not. And the interesting thing, and the reason I mention it now, is that anxiety and a feeling of restlessness often can't be distinguished by the patient. Um, and so a patient may say they're feeling restless when they're in fact a bit anxious, or they may say they're anxious when they're in fact a bit restless. The restlessness generally improves with physical activity, getting up and walking about, whereas anxiety is unlikely to do that. Now, there are different types of anxiety, and in this DSM, the, the listing of all the psychiatric ailments um, as defined in the United States, there are 12 different types of anxiety disorders. Those include things like phobias, where people have fears of things that they shouldn't be fearful of, like going out in open spaces or uh, being, fe being fearful of being in an enclosed space or going in an elevator or something like that. In Parkinson's disease, where studies have been done looking at the different types of anxiety that people have, there are generally three types of anxiety that are found to be much more common in Parkinson's disease patients than we find in the general population, more common than we think by chance alone. The first one, and probably the most common of the anxiety disorders, is something called generalized anxiety disorder. And this is the type of problem that we all think about when we describe a person as a nervous person or overly anxious. These are people who are nervous much of the time, and they worry about lots of different things. So their anxiety is not contained to one thing, which might be quite appropriate, like the health of somebody or your financial situation, but they worry about you know, whether the, uh, the mail is going to arrive on time, whether their check is going to clear even though they've checked their balance multiple times, uh, whether their doctor is going to keep them waiting, whether they're going to get stuck in traffic when they're going to visit somebody, and they always have something to worry about even when it's really clearly not appropriate. So that's a generalized anxiety, excess, unrealistic concern about multiple different things. A second type of anxiety that's increased in Parkinson's disease are panic attacks. And a panic attack uh, is a very, very disturbing thing for the patient because they will have episodes classically described as feeling like they're about to die they may feel short of breath. They ex may experience chest tightness, tingling in their lips and fingers, a uh, ball or constricted sensation in their throat or throat tightness. And these spells are very much like heart attacks, and patients will frequently be taken, in fact, to the hospital because everybody thinks that they're having a heart attack. It's only when they've been through a few and all of the tests for their heart and their lungs have turned up nothing, that it's realized that these are panic attacks. One thing about panic attacks that is generally not understood, even by uh, non-psychiatric physicians, is that they're generally not precipitated by anything in particular. We all would sort of understand somebody panicking if they witnessed something uh, very scary or very upsetting, but panic attacks usually come on out of the blue. A person is just minding their own business, doing something, and all of a sudden they start having this terrible feeling that they're about to die, that they can't catch their breath, that they have chest tightness, uh, and other sorts of symptoms. The episodes usually last about 10 to 20 minutes, and then they resolve. And for patients who have been through this many, many times, it's still always disturbing. It still always feels like this time you're about to die, this time 
something terrible is going to happen. This time, you're actually really having a heart attack. The third type of anxiety is something called social phobia. And this is really quite common. I think this is um, second to generalized anxiety disorder, at least among my patients, where patients have a fear of interacting with other people in groups. And a lot of the concern for this actually is quite justifiable. After all, many people with Parkinson's disease have difficulty with their speech. And because Parkinson's often affects older people, the people they interact with may be hard of hearing. So you have this common problem where the person talking has trouble being understood and the person hearing has trouble understanding. So it becomes a very difficult issue. So Parkinson patients, of course, also may be very concerned about their appearance, uh, especially if they have a problem with saliva. Drooling, I think, is probably the single most concerning symptom people have, the symptom that they're most embarrassed about. But, you know, Parkinson patients also, of course, have tremors, and they worry about people, uh, even friends and relatives, uh, you know, staring at them, uh, and they can become very, very self-conscious. And then you add on top of that the difficulty uh, with speech, and it becomes very unpleasant for many Parkinson patients to be around groups of their friends or relatives, and so they become increasingly isolated, and they find that they become fearful about interacting with groups of people, and so we call that a social phobia. Very important to try to avoid developing that problem because like most problems, the longer you have it, the deeper the rut, the harder it is to get out of them. Now, anxiety may develop by itself so that a person may have no other mood or behavior issues related to their Parkinson's disease other than the anxiety, but it also may develop in association with other problems. So it becomes not a single behavioral problem, but part of a group of behavioral problems. One thing I didn't mention um, so far is that anxiety in Parkinson's disease, aside from the fact that the three types of anxiety that are more common has a different kind of a spectrum then, or a different epidemiology than the general population, is that the age and gender is quite different in Parkinson patients than it is in the general population. As you all know, anxiety is very common in the general population. It's very common in people who don't have Parkinson's disease. But in the general population, anxiety primarily affects women. It's about two or three times more common in women than it is in men, and anxiety in general begins in young adults, people 19, 20, 21, something like that, whereas in the Parkinson population, the anxiety generally comes on much later, generally in association with the Parkinson's disease itself. It may begin a few years before any of the motor features of Parkinson's disease are present, or it may occur with the development or afterwards, but obviously this is much later in life than the average non-Parkinson patient who develops it in their early 20s. It also affects men and women with Parkinson's disease about equally, unlike in the general population where it affects women more than men. So these observations, I think, make it very clear that the anxiety is part of the Parkinson's disease. It's not simply that people worry because they have Parkinson's, so that's one more thing to worry about, but the fact that it occurs even before the motor manifestations are clear, before anybody is thinking about Parkinson's disease, that it must be part of the disease. Now, although it may occur by itself, very commonly it's associated with depression. 
So people who are developing depression frequently also have anxiety or are developing anxiety, and people with anxiety frequently develop depression. Anxiety is also a very common feature, especially early on, in people who are developing memory and cognitive problems. In general, dementia is associated with a lot of be other behavioral problems, and anxiety is one of them. Why that is, is not known for sure. In my way of thinking, it probably represents a person's understanding that they're now developing these memory and thinking problems and that the process of the Parkinson's disease is not simply limited to motor dysfunction, so it gives them, in general, another thing to worry about. And of course, as we all know, I would imagine everybody who's listening to this has experienced anxiety interfering with sleep. You're trying to sleep at night and you're worried about whatever it is, whether it's an appropriate worry or an inappropriate worry, nevertheless it interferes with your sleep. You can't fall asleep because you can't relax. If you can't relax, you can't fall asleep. And you always have something to worry about when you have an anxiety disorder. In addition, when you wake up at night, because you have to go to the toilet or because something wakes you, uh, it becomes very difficult to fall back to sleep, again, if you're worried about something. Now, the anxiety itself then causes problems. It's not as if you're anxious and that's a problem, but the anxiety itself certainly makes a lot of the motor features of Parkinson's disease worse. I always tell my patients, my patients often come to me and their tremor is out of control and I'll ask them whether their tremor is this bad when they're at home and they'll reassure me that their tremor is never this bad except when they're seeing me. So it's a sort of white coat syndrome when your blood pressure goes up when you go to the doctor's office but your blood pressure isn't high at other times. Tremor always gets worse when people are nervous. So I am used to making people's tremor worse, which is probably good because it allows me to see how bad their tremor might be at home, um, but is not so reassuring to the patient. But tremor also makes other things worse. There are many people who have much worse walking when they're anxious, particularly freezing. Freezing of gait is a problem that we sometimes see in Parkinson's where people's feet feel like they're stuck to the ground, uh, and it uh, may increase the risk of falls and certainly interferes with their ability to walk, and that gets worse when people are anxious. Um, and it's not uncommon, uh, it's really quite common for patients to come to my office and tell me that uh, their Parkinson's got worse when their spouse was just diagnosed with cancer, um, and they're worried and their anxiety is manifest by a worsening of their motor function. And while this is, of course, a psychological reaction, nevertheless, it really is almost universal. And uh, people can't control it. They can't just have a feeling of positive thinking, think good thoughts. Uh, the anxiety simply alters brain biochemistry in such a way that for many people it makes their Parkinson's uh, disease worse. Um, people who are anxious don't take their medicines uh, as well often because they're fearful perhaps of side effects. Um, and the anxiety, of course, may annoy other people. Um, there was a study that I saw several years ago uh, that was done in, uh, in New York where uh, a doctor looked at all of the patient calls from people with Parkinson's disease to the office and you know, a large percentage of the calls were really triggered more by anxiety, more about worry about what was happening than actual problems with their Parkinson's disease. And people who are very anxious, you know, annoy other people because they keep bringing up their concerns. Shouldn't we leave now? We're going to be late. Shouldn't we leave now? We're going to be late. There might be traffic. It might rain. It might snow. Um, and they know they're doing it, but they can't control it because they have uncontrolled anxiety. And so patients may, the, the people around them may get annoyed. Now, I lost my, um, 
I'm sorry, I am trying to get my slides. And not only does the anxiety make the motor function worse, but as I'm sure most people with Parkinson's can tell you, when their motor function gets worse, they get anxious. This is a particular problem with people who have clinical fluctuations. People who have on, off uh, will frequently experience severe anxiety when they're off. And for some people, even though they have been off, when that is a period when their medicine isn't working, although they did take their medicine, the offs often feel like they're going to last forever, even though they may have been off hundreds or even thousands of times. Um, people who are anxious, who are having hallucinations or delusions, which are false irrational beliefs, um, will have those get worse when they're, when they're anxious. And one of the most common causes for people to complain about memory failure is really anxiety. When people are anxious, they can't concentrate. Anxiety and depression are similar in a way to, say, having physical pain. If you were having a headache or you had back pain or something like that, you know that if you were given a test, like if you were in school, if you had a headache, you wouldn't do well on that test, and certainly not as well as if you didn't have a headache. If you had severe pain in your abdomen or your back, you would not do well on your test. You would not remember things very well. You don't learn things when you're in pain because you can't pay attention. When you suffer from anxiety or a lot of other behavior problems, but anxiety, you don't pay attention. You're always worried about something, and when you don't pay attention, you don't remember. And therefore, frequently, you're having impaired memory, but it's not from dementia. It's not Alzheimer's disease. It's really anxiety. And it's important to also, you know, just always keep in mind that when you're anxious, your motor symptoms may get worse, particularly tremor. And when your motor symptoms get worse, you may be anxious as well. Now, as I mentioned before, in Parkinson's disease, the genders are different than in the general population because it affects men and women roughly equally. Unlike in the general population, it starts later. And anxiety affects somewhere probably between 20 and 40% of Parkinson's disease patients. Now, that's a very, very high number. It's not nearly that. It's probably about five to ten times higher in people with Parkinson's disease than it is in the general population. So when we're talking about something that's as common as 40%, that's four in ten. Almost half people with Parkinson's may have anxiety and in this slide, number three, I have to underline there are very few treatment trials. This problem has not been well addressed uh, in terms of treatment. There are no large double-blind placebo-controlled trials of medication for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, uh, which is why I made this comment at the beginning that it's an underappreciated problem. Now, there are treatments for Parkinson's disease, and treatment can be very rewarding, okay? The types of treatment that we give could be drug-related, which is the way most doctors uh, like to, uh, to go because it's easier. You just write a prescription, and it certainly uh, requires less time. Um, and sometimes... When a patient complains of problems related to Parkinson's and the patient has severe anxiety, we can actually improve their motor symptoms by treating their anxiety. Um, I saw a patient uh, just this week where this was clearly the problem. The patient thought her tremor was worse, that her motion mobility was worse, that everything was worse. And in fact, her exam looked pretty much the same, but she was really extremely anxious. And by treating the anxiety, we can make or Parkinson's disease, uh, motor symptoms much improved. 
Now, the treatment can be very effective, as I mentioned. Um, there are talk therapies that have been shown in small trials to be helpful. There's something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a form of talk therapy with a limited number of sessions where people, uh, with the help of their uh, doctor, create goals and mechanisms are developed by the doctor to try to overcome their particular problems. There are mindfulness approaches where people learn techniques of meditation, techniques of breathing, other sorts of psychologically oriented things. And then there are drugs. But as I mentioned with the drugs, there, are, there have been no recent, uh, that is in the last 10 years, double-blind placebo-controlled trials for the treatment of anxiety and Parkinson's disease. So the way we approach this is by using the same medications that we use in the general population because they appear to work equally well in Parkinson's disease, but we don't know that for sure. The drugs that are used for treating anxiety are in general very much like the drugs that are used for treating depression, particularly the SSRIs, that is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're drugs that you know of by the names of Prozac, and Zoloft, and Paxil, and Celexa, and Lexapro, and a bunch of other similar sort of drugs. And they all seem to have some benefit on anxiety as well as benefit in terms of treating depression. And as I mentioned before, a very large percentage of people with anxiety also have depression. So these drugs may be particularly helpful. They don't induce Sedation, so they're not, they're not, they don't make people sleepy, and uh, they don't affect balance uh, at all. So they're generally very well tolerated. But there are other antidepressants that also have benefits on, in anxiety, we believe, based on how they affect people in the general population. So drugs like mirtazapine or remeron, venlafaxine, trazodone, um, there are other drugs as well. This list is not complete, so there are many other drugs that might be useful. Occasionally, antipsychotic drugs can be used, but only in the setting of somebody who's having psychotic symptoms, that is, hallucinations or delusions. Sometimes we would use a drug like quetiapine when a patient has anxiety, but also hallucinations, um, because that way we can hopefully treat both. There are drugs that are used only for treating anxiety that do not treat depression. Drugs like Valium, or Diazepam, Lorazepam, Ativan, Alprazolam, which is Xanax, Clonazepam, which is Clonopin. These are all very familiar drugs to the Parkinson community. They are very widely used, and they do have benefits in terms of treating anxiety, we believe, but we don't have proof that this is, in fact, the case. However, we always worry about using drugs, especially on our Parkinson patients, because so many of them are taking so many medications. One of the problems for the benzodiazepines, benzodiazepines are the drugs like Valium, uh, Diazepam, uh, Alprazolam, which is Xanax, Clonazepam, which is Clonopin, um, Lorazepam, which is Ativan, are that we try not to use them in general in older people because they do increase the risk of falling in the general population. And of course, since Parkinson patients already are at greater risk of falling, we worry about that. They may interfere with memory and, and concentration, so they may affect uh, sleep, uh, they may affect um, memory. And they also, especially at the beginning, tend to make people sleepy. Um, they often lose that effect after a period of time. But uh, by making people sleepy, they may nap during the day, in which case they won't sleep so well at night. The advantage of benzodiazepines is that each pill is helpful. So when you take one pill, it will be helpful in the next you know, half hour or hour or two, depending on how long the drug takes to, uh, to produce a benefit, so that these are very helpful drugs for people who only need to take the medicine once in a while. They know they're going out to some social event, 
They know the social event makes them anxious. They can take the pill ahead of time, and they can head off the anxiety. SSRIs are, in general, better tolerated because they don't cause sleepiness for most people. Uh, they don't uh, cause mental fogginess, and uh, they do not contribute uh, to falls. Occasionally, they make uh, tremor worse. Uh, sometimes they make people feel actually uh, restless, uh, which, as I said before, may be experienced as anxiety, so that even though it's a drug you're taking for anxiety, may in fact make the anxiety seem worse at the beginning. The problem with the SSRIs is that they don't work right away. They take a few weeks, two to three to four weeks, before they start to work. So if you're not in a hurry, it may be a good drug to take. Um, obviously, since it takes a while to work, you have to stay on the drug, whereas for people who have anxiety only intermittently, they might prefer to take a drug only once in a while. The antipsychotic drugs should only be taken really with, in somebody who has some psychotic symptoms, and then even though they cause sedation, uh, a drop in blood pressure uh, in some people so that when they stand up, they might faint, um, there is an increased risk of, uh, of dying with these drugs, but it's not very much. Talk therapy is clearly the safest because there are no side effects of talk therapy, but obviously it requires an investment in, uh, in time because you have to travel to the doctor. So as I approach the end of the talk, um, I want to underscore the fact that anxiety is part of normal life. We all experience anxiety, and the person who doesn't experience anxiety probably has more problems than the rest of us. But excess anxiety, anxiety that's out of proportion to the problem that the person is worried about, may interfere with quality of life, and then it becomes a problem. So when a person develops relatively new anxiety, that is, this is not a person who's been anxious since, you know, they were teenagers, but the anxiety has only developed in recent years, the chances are it's probably related to the Parkinson's disease and should be brought to the attention of the doctor who's treating the Parkinson's disease. Anxiety is usually treatable. There are rare patients who can't take these medicines because an additional medicine might just not be tolerated. Um, but certainly talk therapy is always tolerated. Um, so there should be treatment for everybody if the patient's agreeable to that. The medications that we usually talk about when we talk about treating Parkinson's disease are generally focused on motor symptoms. When we talk about treating Parkinson's, everybody has in mind, oh, you're treating the tremor, you're treating the stiffness, you're treating the slowness, you're treating the difficulty getting up from a chair. But in fact, this is part of Parkinson's disease. Anxiety is part of Parkinson's disease as much as tremor, stiffness, and slowness is. And although it's all part of one disease, unfortunately, many of these different problems that Parkinson's causes need to be treated by different kinds of medications. So the medications like L-DOPA that treat motor symptoms generally don't treat the non-motor symptoms. They don't treat the anxiety, they don't treat the depression, they don't treat the dementia, they don't treat the fatigue even. It's helpful for caregivers to be calm and reassuring but just being calm and reassuring doesn't solve the problem. What can you do, and by you I mean anybody who's listening to the call, so patients, their families, their friends, people who are interested in Parkinson's disease, of course learn about the non-motor problems in Parkinson's disease. Simply being able to recognize that somebody has Parkinson's disease when you go to the, uh, to the airport and see somebody who's shaking and walking um, you know, is helpful, but it's not going to help your friend or loved one. That these problems like anxiety and depression and other non-motor problems need to be discussed at support group meetings. People need to learn from others how they cope with these problems because for some of the patients at these support group meetings, 
they may not even be aware that it's part of their Parkinson's disease. It's important that you, as a non-Parkinson patient, acknowledge the problem and understand that anxiety is bothering the patient as much or more than their slowness, stiffness, and tremor is. It's part of the Parkinson's. They're not doing it on purpose. They can't control their anxiety. They need help with this like they need help with the other problems. And being paternalistic and saying, oh, you don't need to worry about that, I'm taking care of it, generally doesn't solve anything. I will conclude by summarizing. Number one, anxiety is common in Parkinson's. You know, somewhere between 20 and 40% of people with Parkinson's suffer from anxiety. It is part of the disease. It's not simply that the person's worried about people looking at them because of their tremor or worried about them being too slow when they walk down the street. It is often associated with other neurobehavioral problems, so anxiety frequently goes hand in hand with depression. It may go hand in hand with uh, psychosis. It may go hand in hand uh, with dementia. So it may not be stand alone as a symptom. It frequently causes the other motor problems in Parkinson's to get worse. Certainly it makes depression worse. It makes uh, dementia worse. It makes memory worse. It is generally under-recognized by all health professionals, unfortunately. And as a result of that, it's undertreated. Those of us in the field believe that anxiety is, in fact, a treatable condition, but we also recognize that our data on treating it is really, uh, unfortunately, uh, almost non-existent. And we need to spend a lot more effort on understanding this and treating it better. Thank you very much for your attention. And Thank I'll be very happy much to answer any that questions. Was, that was terrific. Much, much, much appreciated. Both the pace and the clarity, as well as the uh, high intellectual content of your talk. You know, obviously you're a great teacher, as well as everything else you do so well. So we appreciate it very much. Thank uh, you. No big surprise. We have quite a number of questions in different categories. I had to compliment you by saying that the unusual number of them were answered during your talk. That's not always so, but uh, you did, in fact, handle many of them. Um, here's one that comes directly out of your last, uh, your last comment um, from, um, see, this is from... Uh, no, wait, a, a, a New York, a person from New York. You mentioned that anxiety is quite common, uh, often under-recognized or certainly often not well-treated enough. Um, this person wants to know, do you have a number on prevalence? There's a range of numbers, people who suffer with Parkinson's who also have anxiety. Uh, yes, actually. Um, uh, the number, of course, varies with the study and how the study is done. Um, generally, it's somewhere between six and um, so I have a number here in a in a report between 3.6 percent in one study at the low end and 50 percent in another study at the high end. From looking at multiple studies, I would estimate uh, between 20 and 40 percent. Mm. And you know that that may ve you know these things vary a lot from study to study for a few reasons. One is, what definition do you use for saying a person suffers from anxiety? You can use a questionnaire. There are many anxiety rating questionnaires where people fill out forms and check yes or no about a number of different questions, or they may rate them on a scale of absent being zero or five being very severe, and then you tally the, uh, the numbers and you come up with a, an answer, or it may be based on an interview where you ask them how anxious they are and how it interferes with their life, and it also will vary with the population. If you interview a population of uh, patients who are at some specialty clinic, they may be either more anxious because that's why they're at the specialty clinic, uh, you know, I may see, for example, more patients who have uh, complaints related to behavior in Parkinson's disease than another uh, specialty clinic where the doctor is clearly more focused on, say, uh, deep brain stimulation. You know, so there are going to be fewer patients suffering from anxiety there. So the, the, the 
percentage, the prevalence is going to vary depending on those things. So my estimate is between 20 and 40 percent. Thank you very much, Dr. Freeman. Um, incidentally, for those of you who noticed the last slide was missing the first, the first set, we're putting it up again. So the last slide is now, Eli, just put it back up on the screen. You should see it now. Um, question from California of a taxonomical nature or a classification nature. Um, this, this person wants to know, uh, Dr. Friedman, is anxiety, as you understand it, separate from impulse or compulsive behavior, or are they part of the same family of, uh, of uh, psychological challenges? Um, you know, they actually are both classified under anxiety disorders, but they're really quite different in Parkinson's disease. Um, the three types of anxiety that are increased in Parkinson's disease are generalized anxiety disorder, um, panic attacks, and social phobias. Um, the phobias and the obsessive compulsive disorders are also thought of as anxiety disorders because people in the general population who are obsessive, people who uh, uh, or compulsive people who wash their hands because of fear of drugs, of, of, of germs, or uh, people who are, are neat freaks, they have to have everything lined up exactly correctly, that they get some relief of anxiety. They get very upset. They get very nervous and uncomfortable if they can't observe their obsessive rituals, if they can't have everything lined up properly, if they're house has one speck of dust in it, you know, if they haven't washed their hands in the last 10 minutes. Um, so that is considered an anxiety disorder, but it's really quite different. Um, in Parkinson's disease, untreated Parkinson's or Parkinson patients who are not taking the dopamine agonist, the drug like Pramipexol Mirapex or Ropinirol Requip or Rotigotine Nupro, if they're not taking one of those, we don't see an increase in these in these obsessive compulsive disorders in people who take dopamine agonists like those three drugs that about 10 to 14 percent will develop a compulsive need to do something the most common is gambling people you more men than women but women too may become hypersexual or they may start collecting unusual things um, and yes, it's considered an anxiety disorder, but we don't treat it with, say, benzodiazepines. We don't treat that with Valium, uh, Xanax, or a drug like that. They are sometimes treated with the SSRIs, the drugs like Prozac, uh, uh, Zoloft, uh, Paxil. Those are sometimes, they're not very effective. Um, the most effective thing for that type of disorder is to reduce or even discontinue the dopamine agonist. Um, so, yes, it's related to anxiety, but it's really quite different, and the phenomena that we see in the patients really looks quite different, and the treatment is also very different. Very good. We have two uh, questions concerning what anxiety may lead to, very different nature, one from California, one from a person in Parkinson's, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The California person wonders, Dr. Friedman, does anxiety, is anxiety in any way a predictor of uh, possible dementia later in life? I would say no, but I think that uh, the, it probably increases the risk slightly because, as I said in the talk, that people, uh, that there is an increased association between the two. Um, but I would say the average Parkinson patient who becomes anxious, it's probably not related to dementia. Good, thank you. The next question is very different. Um, it certainly surprised me. But maybe the patient knows something very specifically about this in their own family. The question is whether anxiety can be a cause of um, gastrointestinal complaints, particularly diarrhea. Boy, that's a that's a that's a hard question. I mean, the easy answer to that, I would say, is yes, it can be, but uh, that's not based on any data. It's based on my own observation and beliefs. Um, you know, there's a condition <clears throat> that has a label. It's it's very it's a, it's something I certainly don't understand called irritable bowel syndrome. 
Um, and people with irritable bowel syndrome will have periods of time where they're suffering from constipation, and then they'll have periods of time when they're suffering from diarrhea. And I don't think that there's a clear pathological explanation for this, but patients with that type of problem often also have anxiety. Um, and so it's natural to wonder whether there's an association between the two. Um, and I don't know whether whether that's true or not. I would say that certainly people who are constipated uh, worry a lot about their bowels. I mean, it can be a, uh, an almost consuming type of, uh, of, of interest, um, and people can become very obsessive uh, about bowel habits in order to try to avoid being constipated. And as I mentioned before, you know, obsessions are considered a form of anxiety, although not one of the three things that I, that I mentioned in the talk. Um, I think that there are some people who, when they become very anxious, which, uh, you know, certainly increases their sympathetic tone. You know, people who are nervous may have an increased heart rate. Their blood pressure goes up. So they may also develop changes in the tone of their, of their bowels and may start secreting more fluid into their bowels, which will cause diarrhea. Um, you, know, we, you know, you may joke about it, but when people, people are very scared, very frightened. Um, you know, people who are facing life-threatening uh, situations, you know, sometimes actually become incontinent of stool. So I think... Um, while it would be uncommon, especially for a Parkinson patient who tends to be constipated, uh, to develop diarrhea due to anxiety, I suspect that it may be a contributing factor. If a person has chronic diarrhea, that they always have diarrhea, I would not pin it on anxiety. If it's something that occurs once in a while related to severe anxiety, I would say probably there's a good physiological connection. Thank you. Um, here we have three people who list, listen carefully, obviously, to your list of um, things that can be done to relieve anxiety, and they found uh, things uh, not on the list that they want to raise with you. And we have three of them, which you can handle in any order you wish. From Florida, does marijuana help? From New York, can hypnosis help? And from California, Edmonton, are you feeling we're very participatory person from California. This is the second one we've had for Edmonton. Um, she wants to know, does exercise help? So we have marijuana, we have hypnosis, and we have exercise, physical exercise. Do any of okay. these or all of these help? Um, none of them have been studied. So that's the first answer. So we don't have an evidence base for what I'm about to say. So what follows is my own personal observation or opinion. Um, I have patients who take medical marijuana, and because medical marijuana has not been studied in Parkinson's disease, I never prescribe it because there's no data on which to form a judgment. However, many, I wouldn't say many, but I have some patients who will come to me and tell me they've been using marijuana, uh, and they continue using it, obviously, because they got some benefit from it. At least nobody tells me they take it because they're getting high. They want me to prescribe it. Um, so they tell me that it's helping them. I think, based on the patients I've seen, and I've seen a fair number, um, that it does help anxiety and it does help people fall asleep at night. So in those two circumstances, patients report to me that it's been beneficial. So if a patient was to ask me, can I try medical marijuana for, and then they list anxiety or sleep, I'll say, yes, you can try it. We don't know how effective it is. You know, obviously you try it and you find out and you can decide. Um, I think that for people who are having cognitive problems or are having some hallucinations, that it's not a good idea. My patients in those situations have found that it's made uh, their behavior problems worse rather than better. But I think for anxiety, it's a reasonable thing to try. Um, of course, you have to get your doctor's approval, I guess, unless you live in Colorado. Um, <laughs> hypnosis, uh, that's interesting because I, 
there's very little data. People don't use hypnosis much these days. Uh, I think my guess is that in the in the proper patient, that hypnosis is probably quite effective. Uh, your difficulty will be finding somebody who actually practices hypnosis. I know in my area there are there are virtually no doctors who do hypnosis, but there are some around uh, if you look, um, <clears throat> and it requires certain patients. Patients have to be what's called suggestible. Not everybody can be hypnotized, but I think if a person is hypnotizable and you have a doctor who knows hypnosis, I suspect it probably can be very helpful in some people, um, probably not everybody. Exercise, um, I'm actually somewhat doubtful. I'm a very big believer in exercise, and I tell my patients that exercise is more important than the medicines I give them because exercise is an, is an investment in their future. The medicine helps them today, um, but how they're going to be five or ten years down the road is much more determined by how much they exercise than what drugs they take today. Uh, so despite the fact that I'm a big believer in exercise, and I do believe that exercise can help depression, I'm not so sure it helps anxiety. But that's based on no data whatsoever, and if somebody was to send me a study showing that it did, I'd be happy to eat my words. Great. Terrific. Uh, terrific answer. Thank you. We have a question from a gentleman in Romania, in Bucharest in Romania, I hope we still have to hear the answer to his question. Um, does deep brain stimulation improve or worsen the symptoms of anxiety in Parkinson's? Yeah, that's a very good question because actually there have been papers uh, reporting both. So there are papers showing uh, that in their particular group of patients that anxiety got worse and in other people the anxiety got better. I would certainly not do the procedure to treat anxiety, if somebody had very, very bad anxiety, um, I would probably not do the procedure. I'd be concerned that uh, we're just giving the patient one more thing to worry about, one more thing to obsess about. You know, did I make the right decision when I had this big procedure done? Am I better now than I was before, et cetera, et cetera. After DBS, there's a small percentage of patients who in the first few days after the uh, electrode is implanted, who become somewhat hypomanic, which would be kind of like a really severe, severe form of uh, physical and mental restlessness. Um, so the answer to that is it makes some people better, makes some people worse. In general, it doesn't have much effect. I would use severe anxiety as a contraindication to doing deep brain stimulation. I think people would run into more problems uh, than not. Very, very thoughtful answer. Uh, we probably have time for one or two more questions. So let me just say, since we will have to close after that and a couple of announcements, um, anyone who has an unanswered question, please continue to, uh, uh, to give them to us. We have people listening to this and following it, and they will get back to you when they can and then get Dr. Friedman's help if they need it to help answer the question following the session. Um, so here's... Uh, Let's try this one. Here's an interesting one. You answered this in part, Dr. Freeman, so I'm making you double duty on a piece of this. A uh, person who's a, a, apparently a um, allied health personnel person, she's in the, in the health uh, professional business herself, wants to know whether, in general, the treatment methods we use for generalized anxiety or the other two kinds of anxiety you described at the beginning, are most of those or all of those useful in part for anxiety in Parkinson's or are there, is there one or more uh, treatments for a general anxiety that are simply not appropriate for anxiety in Parkinson's? Um, I, I think that they're all appropriate for treatment in Parkinson's disease, but they really have not been studied. So when I say I think they're appropriate, I'm really saying that my colleagues and I think they're appropriate, but we don't have data to support that. The, we don't generally make a distinction between treating generalized anxiety disorder versus panic attacks uh, versus uh, uh, social phobia. We use the same sort of drugs, although with panic attacks, I think we'd be a lot more likely to 
have uh, a benzodiazepine uh, available to the patient to take on an as-needed basis because that is clearly episodic, um, whereas the other two are much more chronic sorts of conditions. So we would treat the panic with perhaps a long-acting drug like an SSRI like, uh, like sertraline uh, or Zoloft um, and also have uh, a drug like uh, Xanax, alprazolam, available uh, in case of a panic attack. Um, but we treat these as we would treat them in the general population of about the same age. We have greater concern, I think, about using the benzodiazepines, the drugs like Valium and Xanax, because they are generally avoided in older people because of problems with balance and problems with uh, memory and cognition, but we use them. I prescribe them and I get notes back from the pharmacy you know, saying, are you sure you really want to use this drug? This person is over 65. Uh, you know, and, and they shouldn't be used in people over the age of 65. You know, but that's generated by a computer, and they just have these rules uh, that are based on, on age. So we treat them generally as we do in, in, in a population same age who does not have Parkinson's disease. Hmm. Wonderful. I actually want to finish very selfishly with a question of my own. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Freeman, in your talk, that um, anxiety in Parkinson's comes later in life. Maybe it's around the same time as the motor symptoms appear a bit earlier. And I was curious when I heard you say this, is it, is it possible that anxiety is one of those areas that we that may be a, uh, a biomarker or a precursor of Parkinson's, much as the loss of sense of smell we know does pre, uh, pre, pre, is a precursor of Parkinson's? Is it possible that anxiety... Um, uh, could be one of those things studied as a precursor, or has yes. it really been studied? Yes. I, no, it hasn't been adequately studied. I think it could be. Uh, you know, like many of the other biomarkers, like constipation, for example, you know, are just so common in the general population. I think actually, though, that, you know, anxiety occurring in a middle-aged person, for example, especially a middle-aged man, I would guess is probably – and again, I'm making this up, I don't have data on this, is probably uh, a better bi biomarker, say, than constipation. You sure. know, the problem is, how often does anxiety occur before the development of some other neurological disorder, say, like Alzheimer's disease um, or, or something else? And the answer to that, I don't know. But I would say, yes, it should be considered a potential biomarker along with uh, many of these other biomarkers, which, like constipation, are very common in the general population. Um, on the other hand, if you're a person who does not have Parkinson's disease, but you suffer from anxiety, which started five years ago, I, I wouldn't necessarily worry terribly much that you're about to develop Parkinson's disease. It's not that strong an association. That's pretty terrific. Thank you. What a wonderful talk. Um, I can't think of a better way to conclude. I've got a couple of little announcements to make, but um, my friends here have been also picking up plaudits from around the country and the world. And um, we have from Fundacion Parkinson de Colombia, the country of Colombia. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. Terrific talk. State of Florida, excellent presentation. The entire country of Canada, um, uh, at least one person from Canada, says thank you, thank you, thank you. I know there are many things, many other responses we've received of this kind. Uh, terrific talk, and we're very privileged to have you on this. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for... And don't, and don't go yet, please. But, uh, okay. But, but thank you for thanking us. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to frighten you earlier, but um, I have learned through the usual um, uh, reputable sources at this table that uh, this talk has not only been very good, but of the 20-something we've done, or 30-something we've done of these, this is uh, now holds the world record of attendance ah. for our expert briefings, more than 1,700 people. And actually, those who are on the line themselves, online, normally about half of our people come in later in the month, um, 846 people actually online uh, for this talk and 1,700 registered. So that's a record in both areas for a talk like this. And uh, I'm delighted because it means that this very large audience really got what they bargained for in a terrific talk. Um, I had several uh, people ask questions about the book that I mentioned earlier. Yes. 
Yes. And, and would I please repeat the title of it, which I'm happy yes. to do. It is Making the Connection Between Brain and Behavior, Coping with Parkinson's Disease. Dr. Joseph H. Friedman. So I think you should give you what you want, and if you want further information, give us a call. Um, let me go through the, then the uh, public service announcements. Um, we're hoping uh, that um, you're completing our online survey. It should be on your screen now. We're not. We're going to email it out. We will email it to you. It's not on the screen now. We'll email it to you after this session. So when you get it, please watch for it. Please complete. As you've heard me say before, those of you who've been on these uh, sessions before, we really do uh, use these um, uh, surveys very directly in planning our program for next year. And literally everything that comes out of the survey is reviewed for a possible indication of what we should do next year and taken very seriously. So please have us um, uh, do uh, let us know what you think of the session. I want to repeat um, our thanks, not just those of PDF, but all the 846 people on this uh, line for this terrific talk. I want to thank Abby Inc., uh, Kadia Pharmaceuticals, and Lundbeck LLC, the corporate um, partners who made this series possible this year. Thank you to all of them. Once again, they give their support and their financial support for this, which is essential to it, but they have nothing to do with the content that uh, Dr. Friedman and others present. Um, I want to alert you, those of you who are really lifers and uh, 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 regular customers, that the next event will be um, on a Tuesday. I'm sorry, I'm getting this wrong. The archive of today's event begins Tuesday, January 12th, exactly one week from now, Tuesday, January 12th. You'll find it at www.pdf.org, and we'll be sending you an email with a link when it's available so you can listen to the talk again, or of course tell your friends about it if they wish to, if, to um, access it. Um, the next subject in the series uh, is scheduled for Tuesday, March 1st, um, at the usual time, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern uh, time in the United States. The topic will be dealing with dementia, NPD, um, and it will be led by Jennifer Goldman. Uh, she's an MD as well as an MS associate professor at the uh, uh, Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, uh, which is a center of excellence of the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. We've been associated proudly with Rush for 15 years now, uh, supporting their research, including that of Dr. Goldman. So I encourage you, if you're interested in this, if you like this talk today, uh, to come back for the dementia talk on Tuesday, March 1st, uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. I think that concludes the announcement. Anything else we need to say? Um, so um, thank you, uh, everybody who joined us, and a special thank you from um, uh, 1,700 people who will be shouting to the roof if you could hear them. But <laughs> we're, we're denied that privilege, but we can imagine them. Um, thank you, Dr. Friedman, for this uh, amazing and terrific talk. We're delighted to have you and make this series um, the, the very special experience that it is for all of us. Thank well, you. Thank Have you. a great week, great month, and a great year. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you very, very much.